Take your Bibles this evening, if you would, please, to Romans chapter 12, please. Romans chapter 12 for our scripture reading tonight. Romans 12, and we're going to look at verses 9, 10, and 11, just short verses. So let's just read them in unison together this evening, all right? So it's 9, 10, and 11. Are you cold down here in the front? We can turn that fan off if you don't need it on. Are you comfortable all right? Okay, I saw Ali covered up there and didn't know if you were cold or not. Everybody's okay, all right? Let's, uh, as our custom is, let's stand together and read the scripture. Romans 12, and let's read verses 9, 10, and 11 together in unison. Ready? Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Let's pray. Father, add your blessing now to the reading of our scriptures tonight. And Lord, we're uh, again thanking you for the privilege to be here this evening. It's good to be among the people of God, and it's good to be in church on Sunday evening. Lord, it's the last Sunday we have for this year, and as I reflect back on so many Sunday nights that you met with us, and, and you helped us, and you challenged us, and you encouraged us, and Lord, I pray that tonight, once again, you'd meet with us and speak to our hearts through your word. I pray you'd help each of us to give our attention uh, to what you have written to us tonight and what you have to say to each one of us. And so help us to be still and hear the still small voice of your spirit as he speaks to us this evening. Bless the special to that end now, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. For every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer as we come to look into your word tonight and 
we ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd be our teacher this evening and that you would minister to the people of God in this place and to those who might be listening by way of the internet. Lord, that you would keep all of us from distraction this evening, that we would be able to be focused tonight, and you would give us some things that would help us as we head into another new year. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to to begin anew. Uh, Every 12 months, you give us a brand new year that we can put the past behind and we can start with a brand new slate. And Lord, it's, uh, it's a wonderful honor and a privilege, and I pray that we would make the most of 2019, and some things that we look at tonight from Romans 12 would be a help to that end. So help us and speak to us in Jesus' name, amen. The, I came across some statistics about Arnold Schwarzenegger. He smokes $4,000 cigars. Now you think that's awful. Well, his estimated worth is $800 million. He has holdings in private companies like Microsoft and Starbucks that are valued over $20 million. He has custom, if I know this name right, I, this is not the kind I have, uh, custom Pasquale shoes that are $5,000 a pair. His suits are of the finest Italian variety, by a fellow I cannot pronounce. A single suit usually sets him back about $3,000. If he decides to go in the ocean, he cruises in his $4.5 million 88-foot yacht with two grand salons, three sleeping cabins, and a state-of-the-art entertainment center. He bought one of the first civilian Hummers for $117,000. Now, today, he owns a fleet of nine Hummers, worth an estimated $1 million. Of course, the governator, well, he's not governor anymore, He has to keep his body in tip-top shape, so to pump up, he relies on his $3,000 Cybex 700 high-resistance bike. Of course, his hair always needs to be perfect, so that he goes to Stephen Knoll, K-N-O-L-L. Just giving you the name in case any of you are interested in having the hairdresser. He only charges a day rate of $5,500. In fact, the pair of scissors he uses is $400. Now, on the positive note, I'm told that Arnold Schwarzenegger does share some of that wealth, and he coaches the Special Olympics uh, since 1979, and he does give to different charitable organizations. My prayer would be that he would come to know Christ as his Savior and begin to serve him, and then tithe to Bible Baptist Church. <laughs> Just being honest, amen? <laughs> you know, we hear things like that and you're kind of amazed at the wealth that some people have. And, and you think, man, that guy is, is rich. But as I made a mention this morning, he's not the, you know, we, we think they're rich people. But I want you to think about something. I want you to, just in your mind, don't do it physically, but in your mind, go home right now. And go into your bedroom where your closet is and look at your closet. How many dresses? How many skirts? How many shirts? How many pants? How many pairs of shoes? You think about that. How many, how many suits? And, and I realize that 95% of the rest of the world would take a look at our closets and say, you guys are rich. You guys are rich. And we are. We are. But how much of what we have are necessities? Obviously, we understand we could all live with less than what we live on. It's a good spot for an amen right there. It's true. I mean, the Bible says food, clothing, 
and shelter. Those are the necessities that we have to have. Beyond that, it's pretty much luxury. And as Americans, we like luxury. <clears throat> we feel almost everything we have is a necessity. I was reading the other day about someone uh, reminiscing about their childhood from the 60s and maybe the early 70s. Talking about going to just sleep at night with the windows all open because nobody had air conditioning. Hearing the crickets outside, you know, and peeling yourself off the sheet, you know, and because and, uh, of the humidity and, and how nice it was to flip the pillow over because you got the cool side of the pillow. Huh? Some of you relate to that? If we were born and raised in probably any other country other than America, we would understand that it's a blessing just to have food, clothing, and shelter. You know what the greatest state is to live in? I know, you're thinking Ohio. No, you may be thinking Florida or California or Hawaii. The truth is, you know what the greatest state to live in is? The state of contentment. No, no, no cussing in church, Quentin. All right. It's a state of contentment. Paul said this, Philippians 4, verse 19, Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. The state of contentment. Now, I'm going to talk about some necessities tonight. Not luxuries, necessities. I think some necessities that God goes over here in Romans 12 that we can use in 2019. Necessities for the new year. Chapter 12 of Romans, of course, we, we know the first couple verses. We're very familiar with those about presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service, and that we're not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds so we can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then, as he goes through the remainder of the chapter, he begins to kind of lay out for us how that can happen. How we can live out what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's spiritual gifts dealt with here. And then there's just some real practical suggestions, real practical, really, I think, commands that God gives us here that will help us. I call them necessities, all right? And let's look at just three of them this evening, all right? Number one is verse number nine, let love be without dissimulation. And, and that means love sincerely. Dissimulation is insincerely, all right? Uh, let love be without dissimulation. Dearest Jimmy, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I felt since breaking off our engagement. Please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart. Please, please forgive me. I love you, I love you, I love you. Yours forever, Marie. P.S. And congratulations on winning the lottery. I don't think her love was without dissimulation. I don't think she was very sincere. You see, sincere love is not based on what the other person has or what the other person can do for you. Now abideth faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest of these is charity. Okay, Charity never fails. Greater than faith, greater than hope, the greatest of these is charity. It's the supreme good in life. In fact, God put us here. He said that he's, we're here that we might love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples because you have love one toward another, one to another. And so we understand that we're to, we're to, the greatest lesson we have is, and listen, in 2019, why don't you decide I'm going to sincerely love people. So, oh, I love people. Make sure you love people sincerely. Not, not for what you can receive from them. All right? Look at Colossians chapter 3, would you please? Go to your right there after Romans and go through Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, 
Philippians, and then you'll come to Colossians. Chapter 3. Paul is going through with the church at Colossae here about what they need to put off and then what they need to put on. And as he talks about what they need to put on, in verse number 12, he says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on what? Charity, which is the bond of perfectness. God says, above everything else, you put on charity. Our, uh, it's, charity is, is similar to love. It's not the same as love. It's stronger than love. It's a little stronger word than love. Uh, listen, love, if you love me, what did Jesus say? Keep my commandments. He said, here it is. By all men know you might as well because you have love one to another. God is love. There's many times in the Bible that the, God uses the word love. But there's times He purposely uses the word charity. And I think we do a disservice to God if we just change all of it to love. There has to be a reason He chose that word charity. And, and it's not charity like we think of it today, just a handout. No, charity, if you remember 1 Corinthians 13, you can love someone. Love is when you willingly, sacrificially give yourself for the, for the benefit of someone else without expecting anything in return. Okay? That's love. Uh, there is, there is self-love. What is that? That's where you willingly, sacrificially give yourself to help somebody else, but you're expecting something in return. Okay? You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Or when, when you help somebody and then sometime you're in need and, and if you have that thing, if you get the attitude, wow, well, I always help everybody else when they have a problem. Now I got one and nobody helps me. Well, then, why were you helping others? So you could get something in return? See, that's self-love. Okay? Love is, now, charity is this. Now, I can do that. I can willingly, sacrificially give myself to help you even if I don't like you. Okay? That's why God said you can love your enemies. You can love people who don't love you. I can willingly, sacrificially give myself for the benefit of somebody else expecting nothing in return and really not care about you at all. But charity can't do that. Charity does what love does, but charity wants the best for you as well. Charity hopes all things, believes all things, always thinks the best, always desires the best, thinks no evil, that's what charity does. It's, it's a step above. And that's why charity never fails. And so when he's saying, let your love be without dissimulation, he's saying, let's, let's make sure that we have uh, the, the love that God is encouraging us to have and that charity. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 8, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. See, when you really love somebody and want the best for them, you know what you don't do? You don't advertise their sins. You don't advertise their wrongdoings. See? You cover... You, th those, you know, we, we always say, let's just put a lid on it. Right? That's what that does. Puts a lid on it. And that's fervent charity. It's not hard to understand the Bible. It's just hard to live that Bible. Let's put it into practice. Perform, do what, do what God tells us to do. Love people. Ask yourself, how well do you love people? How, how much like Christ do you love people? How well do you demonstrate that love to people? Tony Campalo is, wrote a book called There's Always Something Left to Love. And he told this story in the book. He said, I saw a play entitled Raisin in the Sun. It's in the play, an African-American family inherits $10,000 from their father's life insurance policy. The mother of the house sees an opportunity to escape the ghetto life of Harlem and move into a little house with flower boxes out on the countryside. 
The brilliant daughter of the family sees money as the chance to live out her dream and get started in medical school. But the older brother has a plan that's difficult to ignore. He begs for the money so his friend can go into business together. He tells the family that the money, with the money he can make something of himself and make things good for the rest of them too. He promises if he can just have the money, he can give back to the family all the blessings that their hard life has denied them. Against her better judgment, the mother gives in to the pleas of her son. She has to admit that life's chances have never been good for him and that he probably does deserve a chance at this money that she's going to give him. But as you might have already guessed, the friend took off with the money. The desolate son has to return home and break the news to the family that their hopes for a better future, their hopes for a better life, their dreams are gone. The money's been stolen. The sister lashes into him with a barrage of ugly words. She calls him every despicable thing you can think of. Her contempt for her brother has no limits, and when she finally takes a breath in the midst of her tirade, the mother interrupts her and says, I thought I taught you to love him. The daughter answered, love him? There's nothing left to love. The mother responded, well, there's always something left to love. If you haven't learned that, you haven't learned anything. Have you cried for that boy today? I don't mean for yourself and the family because we lost all that money. I mean for him, for what he's been through and what it's done to him. Child, when, you, when do you think it's time to love somebody the most? When they've done good and made things easy for everybody? Well then, you ain't through learning because that ain't the time at all. It's when he's at its lowest and can't believe in himself because the world has whipped him so. When you start measuring somebody, measure him right, child. Measure him right. Make sure you take into account the hills and the valleys he's come through before he got to where he is. That's a good lesson for all of us. There's always something left to love. When you love someone who's at the lowest point of their life, that's love. Didn't Jesus do that? What about that woman at the well who had five husbands and was with the one that wasn't even her husband? What about that woman they said was taken in adultery in the very act? What about the lepers who were healed? In fact, the complaint they had to levy against Jesus is he loves publicans and sinners. That's the kind of people he wants to be around. That's who he helped. He always was helping people at the lowest point of their life. That's something we all could learn to do. That's something we all could, could, could work on, just like Jesus did. One young boy was overheard asking his playmate, wouldn't you hate to wear glasses all the time? Little boy said, no. Not if they're like my grandma's. She always sees when people are tired or sad. And she knows just what to do to make them feel better. One day I asked her how she could see that way all the time. And she told me it was the way she learned to look at things as she grew older. And after thinking about it for a minute, the first boy said, Yeah, I guess you're right. It must be her glasses. Now we know it's not her glasses. We know it's her heart. And she learned as she went through life how to look at people and want to help people and how to reach out to them in love. Willingly, sacrificially giving yourself for the benefit of someone else with no thought of return. Let your love be sincere in 2019. Not that you're trying to get something. Not we're trying to, to, to get something out of you. You know, if... if 
you've all experienced that. Every parent's probably experienced it. Your child all of a sudden is very nice. Saying all good things and doing all these nice things and pointing them out to you, by the way. And what do you say? What do you want? What are you up to? See? If, if you have to treat people that way and they have to look at you and say, what do you want? What are you up to? Maybe we got some room to improve on loving people as we ought to love them and without any strings attached to what we want in return. Love sincerely. But the second one, this may surprise you. Go back to Romans 12, would you please? Romans 12. The first one is what? Love sincerely. You can talk to me. Love what? Sincerely. Number two, it says in verse number nine, love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Number two is this. Hate strongly. That's what that word abhor means. It means to, It's a little stronger word than hate even. So it's, I'll just use the word hate strongly. You think, well, I'm not supposed, I didn't think we're supposed to hate. No, hatred can be a good thing. The Bible says, hate the evil and love the good. God, God hates the evil. And hatred for evil is commanded by God. Remember Jude 22 and 23, the verse that our theme for this year has been based upon. It says, and some have compassion, making a difference. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. What in the world is that talking about? It's literally talking about hate even the garments of those who have been diseased and those who have been maybe probably leprosy had in mind, that if you just touch their garment, you would get contaminated as well. You would get the disease. If there's a plague that goes on, uh, when, you, when you come home and, and, and somebody had had the plague, you know what they did with the clothes? They burned them. Why? You don't want to come in contact with that. And so we have to hate or abhor and avoid things that would tend to defile us or things that would tend to, to, to be displeasing to God, things that we know are wrong, things that we know are sinful. We cannot, listen, you cannot play with fire without getting burnt. It will affect you. And so we have to have a time to hate strongly. Hate the evil that's in our world. The Bible talks about how we have to, well, notice, notice what he says here. Abhor that which is evil, and then what's the next thing? Cleave to that which is good. If you don't hate what's evil, you'll never cleave to what's good. We tell folks in, in our you when it comes to Psalm 1, that we're to not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Oh, but our delight is to be in the law of the Lord, and in His law doth we meditate day and night. But we'll never get to verse 2 if we don't do verse 1. If you don't say, no, I'm not going to listen to the ungodly. No, I'm not standing in the way of sinners. No, I'm not sitting in the seat of the scornful. I'm going to stay away from the wrong folks. I'm going to get away from that crowd. Then I can delight in the law of the Lord. And in His law will I meditate day and night. But you have to have the hatred first before the love comes. Donald Wildman, some of you are familiar with that name of the American Family Association. In the American Federation for Decency Journal, he wrote these words. These are, these are several years ago now. He said, the truth is, we are anything but a Christian nation. Our behavior as a nation makes a mockery of Christianity. We lead the world in every abomination known to man. Abortions, alcoholism, drug addiction, gambling, divorce, child abuse, violent crime, pornography, and yes, even child pornography. And yet we export our violence and immorality to other countries through our sleazy TV movies and TV programs. We become the moral polluter of planet Earth. If you want to understand just what happens to a nation that does that, you pick up, just jot down, read Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 48. Read about what God said will happen to Israel if they turned away from Him and the curses that would come upon them. And you'll think you're reading about America. It's amazing, the, the, the similarities. Despite these judgments, he goes on to write, we have refused to repent. 
In fact, we have stiffened in our rebellion against God. In our schools, we have abolished prayer, removed the Ten Commandments, and banned the distribution of Bibles. We have terrorized our teachers into believing they'll lose their jobs if they mention God to their students. We have even mandated the teaching of evolution and prohibited the truth of creationism. We're in the process of legalizing and encouraging sodomy, and much worse than that, by the way, and handing out condoms and needles to our youth. We're going out of our way to protect every expression of profanity, obscenity, and perversion. America is thumbing its nose at God. The Supreme Court is in rebellion against God. Our Congress is hardened against God. Our bureaucracy could care less about God. And our educational system has banned God. And there comes a time when the people of God have to take a stand and say that is wrong. There's nothing wrong with saying that is evil. Nothing wrong with saying your behavior is wrong. Listen, that's not you say, don't judge me. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you what the judge has said. Somebody says, only God should judge me. Well, He has. It's right here in the Bible. Okay? Don't, don't you criticize the messenger. You look at the message. This is what God says. And God says certain things are right and certain things are not right. And whatever God says is right and what God says is not right, let God be true and every man a liar. We have to learn to hate that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Edmund Burke said, all that's necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And that's exactly how we've gotten to where we've gotten in America because good people, God-fearing people, Christian people have done nothing have done nothing. We talked, we've been discussing on Wednesday nights for a while now, 2 Timothy 2 and verses 24 through 26. And we're not, we're not saying to, to ride in the streets and to demonstrate and to uh, be obnoxious. No, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. We're trying to help them to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. So we gently instruct and teach and witness and testify, but we have to take a stand against what's wrong. Okay? When Eugene Debs was imprisoned as a conscientious objector, he became interested in a black man who, said, who was said to be incorrigible, devoid of any human goodness. Since the man would not speak to anyone, Debs started a campaign of kindness by leaving an orange on the man's bed and going off without a word. Eventually, the two became friends. Years later, at the news of Eugene Debs death, the black man, now a useful citizen, said this, quote, He was the only Jesus Christ I ever knew. Just hating evil doesn't mean you have to hate people. You love people. And you try to help them. That's what Jesus did and He did it well. And so we have to love sincerely, but when you, Billy Sunday used to say, if you love flowers, you've got to hate weeds. Because they're going to wreck your flowers. And if we love that which is good and we love people, we have to hate that which will ruin their life and that is sin. That ruins people's lives. The devil only kills, steals, and destroys. We talked about the maniac today when those demons came out of him. And they went into the pigs. What did the pigs do? Yeah, they committed suicide. They, listen destroyed how awful that man must have been what were they doing to him destroying him and people are destroying their lives day by day so we have to love sincerely we have to hate strongly the last one is verse 11 not slothful in business fervent in spirit serving the Lord serve zealously Serve zealously. That's what fervent in spirit means. 
We ought to never be lacking in zeal for the Lord. When the yesterday they had the semifinals of the college football playoffs. And you know, the stadiums are filled with 60, 70, 80,000 fans. Fans short for fanatic. Somebody's all painted up green or painted up red or, you know, doesn't have a shirt on or they're all... And, and you know what? Nobody bats an eye. Nobody says, man, those guys are nuts. But, but put, on, put on some decent clothes and go to church on a Sunday night and everybody says, man, you're weird. What's wrong with you? See how completely opposite. Listen, if, if they can be, I like the one fella at Madison um, on the, I know I was getting mixed up, Monday night side. Uh, Monday night, not Friday. What's Monday night? B? A? 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 The, the A, I should remember A, that's aggravated. You know, those are the tough guys over there. And uh, not that you're not tough, Kevin. You're tough. And uh, the, um, this guy said, he's in there like we're, I think he said what? Three life terms plus 34 years or something like that. L.A. is calling. He said, you know what? He said, before I was saved, I was full throttle for the devil. And now that I'm saved, I'm going to be full throttle for God. That's the way it ought to be. Are you full throttle? Do you have zeal in your service? All right, all right, yeah, I'll help the nursery. Okay, fine. Boy, a lot of zeal there, isn't there? No, teach a class? Oh, I, I don't think I could ever teach. That's just not my... Helping junior church? Oh, that's not my cup of tea. You know, me and kids. Nah. A lot of zeal there in that service, isn't there? Boy, it got quiet in here, didn't it? man hurried to the church door one Sunday about noon and people were coming out and he said, oh, is the service over? And the man said, no, the worship's over. The service is just beginning. That's good. One day, Henry Ward Beecher was going for a drive and the livery man brought a fine-looking horse to the door. Henry Ward Beecher said, that's a fine-looking animal you have there. Is he as, is he as good as he looks? And the livery man said, yes, this horse is the best in our stable. He'll work any place you put him. He can do anything and in any time you want him to do it. Beecher smiled and said, can I make him a member of my church? <laughs> <laughs> it's great when people are willing to serve any place, any time, any way, regardless of the special gifts or talents they have. Don't, don't, don't say, I can't do that. I can. Last I looked, there was a verse in the Bible that said something about I can do all. I thought that was still in there. I don't think there, I can't do anything was in there anywhere. I'm not saying that everybody's going to play the piano, because you aren't. I'm not saying everybody's going to get up and sing a solo, because you aren't. But everybody can serve in some way. Everybody can find some way to serve the Lord. We have been saved to serve. We have been saved to serve. We have been saved to serve. I can do this for a long time. We don't hear that enough anymore. We're not saved to sit, folks. We're saved to serve. And you say, well, I... And by the way, your, 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 your avenues of service can change as, as you get older. Okay, it's good, to, it's good to bear the yoke in your youth. That means when you get older, that yoke isn't so easy to haul around anymore. Okay, and, and some of you say, well, I used to be able to, you know, uh, uh, be involved in some of these other things that I can't do now. Oh, but there's things you can do. You know, it's a wonderful thing to take that prayer list and pray for folks. It's a wonderful thing to take the directory and pray for the folks of the church. Um, it's a wonderful thing to pray for your pastor. I need prayer. And uh, there's, 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 there's much to get done every week. 
and I need your prayer. See, there's a ministry. Don't neglect that. Hey, there's a ministry of, of noticing who wasn't here on a Sunday and writing them a card and saying, hey, we missed you Sunday. Hope everyone's all right. And just, just send a card out in the mail. There's always a ministry. There's always a way to serve. There's always something you can do for God. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm blessed. And, and, and I know that. You know, I, there's, a, there's a group of preachers that Brother Dave knows about. In fact, he's the one who got me into it. And uh, we used to have, it was a Facebook group. And, uh, you know, several of them I remember a while back were talking about the struggle they have. They struggle to get people to come to that church on Sunday night. Or struggle to get people to church on Wednesday night. And we don't have that problem. You guys, somewhere you got the idea that two plus two is four, water runs downhill. Pope's Catholic, and we go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And that's, that's what it should be, faithfulness. Faithful to God. And so we're just going to be faithful. And so, but, but, and then most, often, so many times preachers complain, I got 10% of the people doing, you know, 90% of the work and 90% of the people doing. We don't have that here. I don't remember what the number was on Thanksgiving, but it was like 83 or something like that. 83 folks we recognized that were doing something in the church. That's a, that's a great percentage. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm going to keep preaching until it's 100. But, uh, you know, that's a tremendous thing. And I, I'm, 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 I'm blessed to be able to pastor a church where people say, man, let, let me do something. I want to serve the Lord. I don't, I, I, I don't relate sometimes to those preachers who struggle getting people to serve. You know, we, we just want to keep the mindset that God has given us the responsibility to serve Him. That's what we have. That's what our life is. It is we're going to live for the one who loved, him, loved us and gave Himself for us. Baptist minister rushed down to the train station every day to watch the Sunset Limited go by. No chore would ever take him out of his ritual. Members of his church were very disturbed by that ritual. And they asked him to stop. And the preacher said, no, I won't stop. I won't give it up. I'll preach your sermons, teach Sunday school, bury your dead, marry young people, uh, you know, do, do everything you want me to do in the church, but I'm not going to give up meeting the Southern Pacific train every day. I love it. They said, why won't you give it up? He said, it's the only thing in this town that I don't have to push. <laughs> we don't, you know, we ought not to have to push anybody to serve. Amen? Somebody, I saw something the other day, you shouldn't have to, what was it? It wasn't shame. It was you shouldn't have to beg people. You shouldn't have to beg Christians to go to church. Think about that. You don't have to beg Ohio State fans to go see an Ohio State football game. In fact, you don't have to beg them. You just have to put tickets and you sell them. Hundreds of dollars. Louis Pasteur, the world-renowned French chemist, Invented the process of pasteurization, of course, and other things. He developed vaccines for several diseases, including rabies. He said, in what way can I be of service to humanity? My time and energy belong to mankind. Well, I got one better than that. My time and my energy belong to God. And He deserves the best. That's why we meet on Sunday, first day of the week. See, God, God deserves first place first place if the world the world makes the weekend on Sunday because if you're going to put God somewhere okay put him at the end okay but don't let it affect the rest of your week okay but wait a minute when you open up your calendar what's the first day of the week Sunday it is the God's day it's the first day of the week Jesus said talking to his disciples Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, your servant. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ came to serve. So should we. Let's serve zealously. 
in 2019. An old Quaker, 82 years of age, said, I'm going to live until I die. And then I'm going to live forever. Okay? You know, it's a great thing to live till you die. How are we going to do that? You're going to do it by loving people. You're going to do that by hating strongly the evil. You're going to do it by serving zealously for the Lord. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening, these three simple thoughts that I pray will help us and will keep in mind throughout 2019. Just one more day to go and we turn the calendar. We start a new year. I pray, God, that you would help each of us in this room and as a church collectively, but as people individually, To love sincerely. To have a genuine love in our heart that we would allow the love of God that's shed abroad in our heart to be shed abroad to others. To love people who no one else wants to love anymore. That we'll love them. We'll have fervent charity among ourselves. That not only will we love one another, we'll have charity for one another. We'll want the best for each other in our church family. That we'll hate strongly the evil that's in our world. We'll abhor that which is evil. We'll not even want our garment to be spotted by the flesh. We'll, we'll, we'll hate that. Help us to stand against the evil in our day. And having done all to stand. Father help us to serve you zealously. Help us to have zeal. Help us to do what we do in your power and your strength not in ours. And I pray Lord you'll give us a very fruitful and profitable 2019. Help us to live until we die. Or live until we hear the trumpet sound. And you come back for us. Keep us faithful to you. 